At the end of a person's life, he's not going to say, I wish I made another deal. Gee, why didn't I go into the office last Sunday? A person's going to say, you know, why didn't I spend more time with my wife? Why wasn't I kinder to my children? Why didn't I care more about people? The person you're about to meet in this interview is probably one of the smartest people I've ever met. When I asked him a question, he had not only the answer, but a thoughtful, informative, and insightful response. He is somebody I was wishing I could interview. We went to Israel. This conversation took place, I believe, in early October before the attacks. And it was a phenomenal conversation with Rabbi Breidowitz. If you don't know who he is, buckle in and enjoy. Being a Jew? Awesome. Managing personal finances? Not so awesome. Welcome to Kosher Money. We're privileged to be here in Yerushalayim at the headquarters of Ar Sameach. Beautiful, beautiful campus. Last I've been here, it's really grown. Rabbi Breidowitz, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, thank you. It's a real pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. So this topic and the entire conversation will revolve around money, finances, and the opening question is, why does God want so much of our time to be dedicated to the earning of money? We know we work nine to five. Is that nine to five due to the curse or is some of that self-inflicted post-curse? You know, that is an excellent question. And in point of fact, we see kind of two different approaches, at least two different approaches throughout Chazal, rabbinic literature. One is that the ideal state of man is in the Garden of Eden, uh, where everything is given to you, and basically you spend your whole life learning Torah, thinking about God. And the fact that we have to uh, work is the curse of that you have to earn your bread by the sweat of your brow, and this is the curse of Adam HaRishayim. But there is a, another mahalach that we do find, another approach that we find in the literature, and that is, even though it is true that the expulsion from Gan Eden puts us in a plan B scenario, but within plan B, there's a certain optimality that we do work, because in a sense, working can be a mechanism to achieve what we sometimes call tikkun olam, uh, repairing the world, rectifying the world serving God not only through the purely spiritual, but even through our confrontation with the material. In many, many ways, earning and spending money, you might say, is where the rubber meets the road. You know, you can have very high spiritual ideas. How do you translate them into the nitty-gritty of life? And as a result, our involvement in the working world is really a great opportunity to kind of implement in a very real way the values and morals of the Torah to show that we can elevate everything, that we don't consider Gashmiyot's physicality, materialism as inherently evil. We regard it as a neutral. It can be a source of great sin and temptation, and it can be a source of sanctifying God's name. And our job is to take that confrontation with materialism and elevate it and sanctify it in a good and noble way. So, yeah, it might very well be, had there not been a sin, maybe this wouldn't have been necessary. But once we're in that matzav, instead of looking at it as a curse, we look at it as an opportunity to eventually bring us back to the Garden of Eden, at least through the process of confronting the world as, as we have it. We say every day in the Shema, twice a day in the, in the Shema, you shall love Hashem, with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your ma'od, all of your might is typically translated. But Chazal offer as one of the interpretations, with all of your might, as all of your money. And uh, the Gemara uh, asks the question, if you have to be willing to give your life for God, why is it necessary to say you have to give your money for God? But one of the answers that's, uh, that's given in Svarim is, that in a sense, giving your life is, of course, a tremendous thing, but that's like one-time sacrifice. You know, I, I, I give my life for God in 10 seconds of, you know, ecstasy. But when you're kind of using your money in the right way, that's a lifelong temptation. Every single day you're going to face that. And to face something day to day to day to day might be indeed spiritually a greater achievement than even the one moment of giving your life. Al-Kinish Hashem. 
So there's great opportunity. There's great danger. And there's also great, great, great opportunity. And that is why, in some ways, the Torah wants us to work, to show that we can implement the Torah's values in a material world. Uh, it is also the case that productive work gives a person a sense of dignity. And that's very important. Uh, in serving God, in our learning, in our davening, a person has to have a sense of dignity, of an inner chashivus. And malacha does that. Uh, productive work does that. Rabbi Yochanan says, Gedola malacha, great is work. Shemachabedes espaleha. It brings honor to the one that engages in it. And it's an opportunity to sanctify God's name that people should see. A Jew uh, lives by morality, lives by ethics, and that causes the, the name of God and the Torah to be glorified and respected in the eyes of others. That's a very, very good thing. I always find it when I look out onto the world, not from a perch necessarily, but I, I, I wonder if there's a real challenge for those who are wealthy to give over that message to their children, right? Their children are growing up in a world where everything they want is there for them, but yet they sort of lack that innate drive or the fulfillment of that tikkun olam where it's, it's a real responsibility for those that have accumulated wealth to bring up their children. Of course, the, the wealth may not last, so it's all the more important, but there's a real challenge for those who've attained wealth to give that message over. No, 100%. And I, and I think uh, the issue you're raising has been recognized not only within the Jewish community, but even within the broader community. And very wealthy people are struggling with this. Uh, their children didn't go through the struggle of having to build something up. Um, the goodies of life were handed to them on a silver platter. How does that prevent a person from becoming arrogant, smug, complacent, maybe uh, egocentric, selfish, and the like? And it, it is a real problem in raising our children. But as they say, there are different ways of doing this. Uh, certainly, if a person is committed to Torah and mitzvot, he will give over that message. He will give over the message that if God gave us prosperity, it's because that creates responsibility. To he who is given much, as the saying goes, uh, there is expected much. And Baruch Hashem, I mean, I, I'm personally aware, I, I don't want to you know, start mentioning different names, but of families in with which this ethic of responsibility has been handed down in a very good way. And you have second and third generation wealthy families, kids who were born into large wealth, but they understand that that creates certain responsibilities. You know, Chazal talk about everything in life is an Isayo, and everything in life is a challenge. There is the challenge of poverty. If one is struggling, and I know you've done shows on budgeting and people who have difficulty making it, and that's a great challenge in your faith in God and your also responsibility to try to budget. But, you know, wealth is also a challenge. You know, people sometimes think, oh, if only I would be, you know, fiddler on the roof, if I'd be a rich man, you know, life would be, you know, so wonderful. Truth is, the Nisayon, the challenge of wealth, is an enormous challenge. Yeah, maybe you'll physically have whatever you want materially, but are you going to use your wealth in the way that God uh, intended it? In many ways, Chazal say, the challenge of wealth is even greater than the challenge of poverty. Well, uh, but as I say, Baruch Hashem, I, I think we can be proud of the fact that I think there are a number of great, great, philanthropic families within Klal Yisrael that pass down this ethic to their children in a very good way. I want to touch on something you mentioned before about um, Gan Eden and, and that utopia. There was recently a discussion on AI between Elon Musk and Bibi Netanyahu. And Elon Musk des described the future of AI as a future that's leading to a utopia reminiscent of Gan Eden before man was exiled from there. And in that period, there was no need to work. It was a period without scarcity. And Bibi replied that since man's eviction from Gan Eden, humans have largely been defined by their career. What do you do for a living? And I bring this up because Growing up, we think Mashiach is coming on an eagle, and it's almost like a Disney-like magic experience that 
snap of the finger, we're going to be transported to Eretz Yisrael. And maybe there is some truth to that, but are these advancements in AI, in technology, the, the rapid progression over the last 50 to 70 years where I grow up and I look out to Israel and, and the buildings that are popping up and from the year 1200 to 1700, there were very little, I mean, there were some advancements, but the last 50 years, it's been booming. Is this progression a telltale slash realistic sign that Mashiach and the end of days and the world to come is is imminent? Uh, again, it's an interesting point, and it's also interesting to see... Uh... B.B. and Elon Musk, you know, debating uh, fine points of, of biblical theology, Baruch Hashem, I hope uh, that'll continue. The issue of the acceleration of progress, that things happen in five years that may have taken 2,000 years to have equivalent advancements, that was already noted even before computers. The Hafez Chaim actually made the observation that since the Industrial Revolution in the 1800s, you know, things have been moving really, really, really fast. And uh, in a short uh, amount of time, Man advanced, at least in a material way, uh, more than occurred you know, over several thousand years. And he pointed out that that is indeed a messianic sign in the sense that a certain, it's hard to understand it fully, but a certain amount of stuff has to happen before Mashiach comes. The world has to come to a certain level. So theoretically, God could wait many, 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 many years. But if, because of our spiritual defects, we need to bring Mashiach quicker, then things have to happen quicker. So in a sense, you're condensing thousands of years of natural developments in a very short time. So yeah, uh, I think the rapidity of technological advance, I believe I've seen statements that the world's knowledge doubles every five or 10 years or something, some, some amazing, amazing, amazing number. I think uh, the Chavitz Chaim identified as being connected with the Messianic era. Now, I do want to say, though, that, you know, if you look at uh, the Rambam's description, at least, not, not everybody agrees with the Rambam, but the Rambam in Hilchos Molochem, where he, dis he discusses in Moshe Mashiach, perhaps his description may be a little disappointing to some people, but the Rambam says that Baruch Hashem, there'll be a Beis HaMikdash, and there'll be Nevoa, and there'll be Ruach HaKodesh, and the Jewish people will come back to Israel, and there won't be war. Wonderful, wonderful things. But life as a whole... It's going to be normal. You're still going to have to have a job. You're still going to have to work. Uh, you may face some of the same trials and challenges we have today, meaning the Rambam's opinion about the Messianic era is that it is not, at least at its inception, it is not going to be a supernatural return to the Garden of Eden yet. Perhaps resurrection of the dead at a later stage may be that. So, so in truth, uh, you know, the Mashiach is not going to solve a lot of the issues that we still have to face in everyday life. Now, of course, the world will be immeasurably a better place, and that itself will contribute to our ability to make right decisions. But there's not going to be a guarantee. So uh, these things are not going to vanish. I'd be remiss if I didn't follow it up with a question that has been in the back of my mind for almost ever. In the, in the Dor HaFlaga, in, in those times, is it possible technology existed and it was lost to us? This is quite amazing. I, I don't think, I don't want to say for sure, I don't think there's any makor in Chazal for it. But on the other hand, there is a whole discussion of Irevianus and Apitz, who actually viewed the Migdal Bavel as a type of racket. First of all, it was amazing that he was able to describe it, you know, in the uh, seven, 1600s. And he was saying, this is the Zor HaFlaga a rocket that literally had jet propulsion to go all the way into the furthest reaches of space. So uh, he is absolutely suggesting that there was a lost technology that even in his time was totally lost. We hadn't recovered some of it till very, very recently. So yeah, you know, we, we, sometimes, we make a big mistake when we think the ancients were primitives or, or, or whatever it is. First of all, in terms of philosophy and theology, you know, they, they are the foundation, I mean, both in Judaism and outside of Judaism, they're the foundation of modern wisdom. But even as a matter of science and technology, there may be all sorts of things, secrets that were lost in time. And Rivanus Napschitz explicitly connects that to the Dorhaflug.
A quick break from this week's episode to tell you about what Kol Chabad is doing. Kol Chabad is the longest lasting organization in Israel. They've been at this for hundreds of years. And given what's going on in Israel right now, there is a need to provide food and clothing to hundreds of thousands of displaced individuals. People from the South have been brought up to hotels and other shelters, but they need food and they need clothing. And Kol Chabad is delivering that. I get email after email after email of all the updates, pictures, photos, videos of the amazing work that they're doing, and they need our support. Okay, so if you have ten dollars, eighteen dollars, even one dollar, one hundred eighty dollars, three hundred sixty dollars, you can do a recurring donation. Legitimately, so much is going on in Israel, and so much good. So please be part of that good wherever you are in the world: America, Japan. You could be out in Canada, Mexico, Brazil, Portugal. There are so many countries, people within those countries, people like you that are watching and saying, hey, how can I help? This is an, a really impactful way to help. Visit kolchabad.org slash kosher money. The link is in the show notes. Give what you can. And if you want to learn more before you give, click around their website. Sign up for their emails. They're they're doing so much and be a part of that good. We really need your help. And Kol Chabad is a proven organization that's there for the people of Israel week in, week out, and especially during this time. Thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts. And now back to this week's episode. We spoke before about wealth and luxuries. How, how does the Rav view needs and wants, especially in a time like this with same-day shipping and, you know, you click of a button. Yeah. If it's not there within an hour, we start wondering. But it brings up, you know, when, when a child says, I, I need that ice cream, and the mother says, do you need it or do you want it? How, how does the rub look at the knees versus worms? Yeah, it's an enormous challenge, just even in terms of, let's say, basic food. The idea that whenever I'm a little hungry, I have something to eat. This is something that does not exist for most of human history. Even if you were, you know, well off, you were not, uh, you didn't necessarily have food on demand 24, 24 7. And in, in many ways, we're also a victim of what you might call Madison Avenue culture. The whole theory of advertising is to turn optional wants, well, to create the want and then, then elevate the want to a need. This is the whole psychology of how you make a commercial and, you know, the whole chachma, uh, to, you know, maybe it's a negative chachma, but the whole chachma and how to convince people they really need a new car, even though they got their last car, you know, two years ago and it's, and it's doing fine. And it's also connected to instant gratification too. I mean, I remember Years ago, this is before I even had a computer, but I had I bought a fax machine for the first time, an old you know paper fax machine, and I had to send a fax to China, from Baltimore to China, and it took around a minute and a half, and I was drumming my fingers. I was saying, "What is taking so long to go from Baltimore to China?" You know, and you see how spoiled you know we are. You know, instant communication now, email, WhatsApp, whatever you're doing. So we get habituated to, I want it, I want it now. Um, I don't want to fix it, I'll get a new one. I got to have, I got to have something. A want becomes a need. A need becomes a compulsion. And it takes over a person, you know. I remember years ago, maybe they still run the campaign, Pepsi Cola had a, Pepsi had a campaign. Buy enough Pepsis, you get points, Pepsi points. And the tagline was, drink Pepsi, get stuff. And I thought to myself, get stuff. It doesn't even make a difference what you're getting. I want to get stuff. I need stuff. The materialism can, can be a real, real poison, meaning do I own my possessions or do my possessions own me? And it is a very, very important lesson to kind of try to define what do I need, what do I want. If something is only a want, well, that doesn't mean you can't have it. Let's see. Let's balance it against other more important things. And part of raising responsible children, both in Jewish and, and even outside of Judaism, is the notion of delaying gratification. That's part of maturity. I believe there was a famous psychological experiment, I'm not sure if I remember all the details, about uh, kids who were uh, offered uh, treats, and if they want it right now, they get one, uh, but if they can wait a half an hour, they get two, something like that. 
And it was shown that as young as five, this was a predictor who would be a successful adult. Those who were able to kind of push off for later benefit became just more successful in life because they didn't have to have it. They didn't have to have it right, uh, right now. So we have a lot of challenges. The fact that everything is available, whether it's uh, information on the internet, whether it's true or not, uh, whether it's food, whether it's, you know, this idea of, of uh, social media where, you know, you connect immediately to whatever you want to connect to um, has some real negative effects. Again, I'm, I'm not anti-technology per se. I think there's a lot of good things you can do with technology. You know, your podcast is a great example of that. But we cannot deny that it creates a lot of nisio notes. And again, even, even things like um, ability to concentrate when you get into a, a modality of web surfing. You're jumping from thing to thing to thing to thing to thing, whatever, whatever thinking and integrating. Um, I understand that. I'm not sure if it's true, but I, I had heard that some universities were banning, banning laptops from the classroom because they thought it was affecting the ability of students to concentrate. Again, I, I can't vouch for that, but it's something I heard. And I believe that, you know, the standard college seminar had always been 50 minutes. And I think, uh, at least on YouTube, they had to cut it down to 30 minutes or 25 minutes because people cannot concentrate for more than a half an hour at a time. So we are affected. And, this, and I'm not just referring to the secular world, the, the Jewish world, the firm world. We are affected very, very much by the culture of instant gratification, the inability to focus. That affects, by the way, the quality of our Torah learning as well. People can't, they just can't sit, they can't work, they can't work through anything. That affects our marriages. When there's a problem, we just want to get out of it. It either works right away or forget about it. So there's all sorts of ripple effects that this culture of instant gratification has that are very pernicious, very dangerous, very deleterious. And we somehow have to, have to fight it in some ways. Now, again, though, I mean, I, you know, maybe I, uh, I'm too much of a softie. You know, I, I, I don't like to deny children things. No, they should have things that, you know, give them pleasure, give them joy. That's part of a loving relationship. But there also have to be limits and understandings as to what's important. Maybe some type of condition. I, I know people, some people are against bribing, but Chazal talk about this, you know, learn a Mishnah and you'll get, you know, uh, I'll get some ice cream. I know some parents say, I, that's not right. But, you know, Chazal talk about giving children these types of incentives. So maybe link it to a mice at toe. You know, give stucca, you know, I'll give you a, a raise in your allowance, but you have to give 10% to stucca to understand that if Hashem gives us wealth, we have to share it with people. I think about that from time to time in that in a smartphone, there is so much knowledge that one can attain. And yet the world is looking at cat photos and, you know, the viral clip of the day. Yep. And... If we were to stop and think, literally stop and think, you know, my best ideas come to me when I'm in the shower because I'm not distracted or I'm driving on the highway free of technology, almost just me in the open road. I've personally witnessed, and I just spoke to someone else recently, that when they started their business, it was a poof, it was a period in their life in which they transitioned to a flip phone because we were, for almost two years, we were, I was solely focused on growing a business and it wasn't ding, 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 looking, not allowing the brain to manifest thoughts. Yep. No, again, it's a very, it's a very, very critical point. Revolver talked about this. I, I'm not sure if he was talking about cell phones or smartphones. Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe it would be nifter before he came to comment. He was talking about the fear of modern man to be alone with himself. We need constant distractions because we're kind of we don't know what to do with ourselves. Mm. And he says, Ben Aliyah has to you know, be machshiv, to kind of develop a capacity to think, to analyze, to introspect. And as you say, this is when ideas come. This is when your consciousness gets opened up. When you're constantly buffeted by distractions. You know, you simply never develop the inner resources that you need, both intellectual, moral, spiritual. So we talked about the idea that we need not to be afraid of ourselves. 
we need to confront the silence within. Because there you'll find Hashem. The Vilna God says in Mishlei, an amazing thing. He says, every person, every person has Ruach HaKodesh. Every person has divine inspiration. There's God's voice speaking within you. But there's so much static that we often don't get the message. But it's there. And if we can clear away some of that static. Now, ideally, that's what Shabbos is supposed to be. You know, I remember a few years ago, some uh, brilliant person was trying to create a halachically valid way that you could text on Shabbos. He did a different halachic argument. Uh, the arguments were, were spurious anyway, but, but let's imagine he could come up with that. Let's imagine that halachically he could create a form of texting that would be mutter. What type of destructive idea is that? I mean, part of the greatness of Shabbos is it forces us to get away from this. So you want to bring it in <laughs> by some halachic, uh, whatever, whatever formula you want to add? Now, I know uh, in the modern Orthodox community, I, I read a few years ago, there's a phenomenon among teenagers. They say they keep half Shabbos, which basically means that, you know, they try to be Shomer Shabbos, but they have to text. They have to text. They can't stop. I mean, maybe it's Bikuach Nefesh. I don't know what, what the heter is. But at some point, it, it becomes an addiction. And when things become an addiction, you have to see that you're out of control. Dr. Abraham Tursky is a Zichron Olivracha who's an expert in, in addictions, so he was a psychiatrist, uh, as well as a great, great tzaddik, uh, uh, Chacham. He says addictions mean when you can't stop, you're addicted, whatever it is. It could be the coffee, it could be the beer. Maybe some addictions may not be so bad, but some addictions can be very destructive, besides the fact that they're Mechal Shabbos, which is pretty, pretty awesomely bad in and of itself. But as Revolva says, you, you, don't, you don't develop the fullness of your personality when you're constantly being distracted. So Shabbos is a great bracha in a sense to create that technology-free free zone. So why would we want to take that away? Well, they, there was a professor in Yale, a brilliant guy, and uh, the students wanted to get him removed because they said he was getting senile because he contradicts himself from day to day. Uh, one day he says this, next... So he said, you see how smart he was, he said, you know, I'm not like these guys who work out a problem once in their life and they stay with it. So every day I rethink the sugya, I say a different thing. It's not because of senility, it's because I rethink the problem. I just wanted to add that I remember hearing something, B'Shem Revel Yoshev, and again, I, I can't say I remember the exact quote, so I, so I apologize, in which he was talking about uh, most roast luxuries, you know, extra things. And he said that things that give you a greater calmness and a greater serenity are not luxuries. So he was talking, for example, about getting help and cleaning the house. You know, I particularly, you know, I, I, I've been, I live in Yerushalayim, obviously, and many Avrecha, many Kolo couple are living on very, very tight budget. And even to have cleaning help, you know, might be for them a major expense. But he said, you know, if it makes your life more masudar, that's not called luxuries. Those are things that help you in your avodah Sashem. And I think that's a helpful, you know, guideline generally to needs versus wants. And that is, you know, Chazal acknowledge that a beautiful home, an organized home, mark even, they give a person an expansiveness of mind. So we're not supposed to kind of live in a hovel unless, you know, unless you're on the level where it doesn't bother you maybe, but, but you know, for most people, if this is something that creates anxiety, it creates tension, then I think the Torah wants that to be addressed in a positive way. So we're not supposed to be ascetic, abstemious. We're supposed to kind of have a, or try to have a relatively comfortable life. And Rabbi Yashif said things that give you calmness are, are necessities. And of course, the Rambam himself writes in the Shemona Prakim, his Hakdamit Pirkei Avos, that looking at beautiful things can relax a person, give a person serenity, and then they will be able to serve Hashem in a better way. So that would be, you know, again, you have to be sure not to abuse these ideas in a hedonistic way. But I think within reason, you know, there's a makam for vacation, there's a makam to appreciate nature, there's a makam to try to create a comfortable environment to get the help that you need, not to be frazzled or nervous or tense, because God does not need nervous wrecks. 
I have to say, you know, we're just, we're just coming out of Yom Kippur. Bezrus Hashem, Kali Sol Shabi Zochet Zor Gemar, Gemar Tov. And, you know, in the yeshiva world in particular, Elul, Yomim Narayim, is kind of a very tense time. And there are reasons for it, you know, Eimah Sadin, fearing God's judgment, is a very serious thing. But on the other hand, we also have to know that if it makes us, like, overly nervous, anxious, debilitated, you know, we're not going to get the job done. God does not want a bunch of nervous wrecks because they don't do what they're supposed to do in the world. So the notion of serenity and menucha sanefesh is something that's very, very important in a Jewish home. And that may include things that externally may seem to be luxuries. But as Rabbi Yashif is saying, they, they may have a din of necessities at some level. Travel comes to mind when the Rav mentions scenery, nature, what, what role does travel have? Because we say, Hashem, and there are absolutely beautiful sites that a photo on the internet doesn't do it justice when you approach some of these sites. Someone with the means to do that, is that something that they should have on their so-called bucket list of life? You know, it's, it's a hard question, actually, because if you think about the way many vacations work, uh, there's a tremendous amount of work, a tremendous amount of frustration, meaning the, the pleasure to frustration ratio might not be as high as you hope. And people often come home needing a vacation from a vacation, mm -hmm. you know, frenetic activities. So vacations are not always all that they're described to be. On the other hand, the concept of Ma Rabu Masach Hashem is a real concept. The Chida, now the Chida didn't take vacations per se, but the Chida, Rav Chaim Yosef David Azulai, back in the 1700s, uh, he was a world, a relatively world traveler. He lived in Eretz Israel, but he spent uh, a lot of time going to European countries, Africa, collecting money, basically. He was a fundraiser. I mean, he was one of the Gedolim, but he was also a fundraiser for Yeshivos and the Kehilos in Eretz Israel. And the one thing we have, we actually have, Chida wrote many, many, many svarim on all subjects of the Torah, but one of his interesting books, uh, safer is a travel log. He would describe the different places that he went to, and he made a big point, in spite of the fact that he was a Godel Batora, of going to the zoos, going to the museums, going to the British Museum. Sometimes it was to look at manuscripts of Swarm, but other times it was just to look at things that were there, looking at different animals, there, different types of societies, different types of people, because he felt by seeing the beauties of God's creation, he had an enhanced appreciation of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Now we find that Chazal, or Masakain, special brachos when you see unusual animals, at least in Eretz, you see elephants or, or whatever it is. They wanted us to have a sense of wonder. You see something special, you see something beautiful. I know people who have gone to the Grand Canyon, and I, I actually myself have never been there, but they describe it as a spiritual experience. Now again, I'm not going to address the halachic issue of leaving Eretz Yisrael, because you know, this is, your audience is lapped off to Eretz Yisrael, so I'm not going to get into the issue, should I leave Israel to go to the Grand Canyon? That, that, that raises some problems. Even then, there are heterim. But certainly, let's say, if, you, if you're not in Eretz Yisrael, these trips can have a real spiritual component. And indeed, I would suggest that that should be part of our vacation planning. Part of our vacation planning is, what can we do that would enhance our appreciation of the beauties of Hashem's world. And that should be part of the cheshben, maybe, to spiritualize the vacation. You know, they say Bishem the Kutzke Rebbe, beautiful pshat. Now, maybe it's not Pashat pshat, but it's a chesidish pshat. It says in Pirkei Avos that if a person is a mapsik mishnasa, he stops learning, and he looks at a tree and he says, Ma noah ilangza, how beautiful is this tree? He stops learning. Mishayev ben Apsho, he deserves to die. How dare he stops learning to look at a tree? Right? So the simple meaning is, you're looking at nature when you could be learning. How could you do that? That's Pachat You know what the Katsuka Rebbe says? He says, the problem is, he stopped his learning to look at the tree. But if he looked at the tree as a continuation of how he glorifies God, that's a good thing. That's a wonderful thing. That's a hemshich. That's a continuity. 
So I can see a role for it, but you got to balance it against a lot of other things. You have to balance it against the tircha. You have to balance it against what are you giving up? So for example, uh, if you're not going to dive in with a minion, it depends where you're going, but you know, sometimes people go on trips. Uh, they, they, they won't have to feel a bit seaboard for uh, three weeks or whatever it is, or Shabbos. How will they keep Shabbos? So like everything else, I, I think there very much can be positive benefits. I know chashuva chashuva people who take vacations camping. And again, I'm not, I'm not here to paskin anything, but uh, they didn't even have a minion during the week at least. But they held, it was so necessary to recharge their batteries and give them chizik for the year that they held it with such a... Again, ask your local Orthodox rabbi for guidance on this. But I do know that there are chashuva chashuva, people who are truly, truly chashuva people who made such a cheshpan that this vacation was a good thing. But again, you have to balance it like everything else. It's hard to give a single answer to all of these things. We'll be right back to this week's episode with Rabbi Breidowitz, but first I want to tell you about Twillery's Black Friday sale. The shirt I'm wearing is from Twillery. The pants I'm wearing is from Twillery. Practically most of my clothing at this point is Twillery, and there's a reason for it. It's super comfortable, it's highly durable, and you don't have to send your clothing to the cleaners. Stop wasting money getting those starchy shirts back from the cleaners. This is machine washable. So yes, it's not the cheapest clothing, but if you're in the market for clothing, this is highly durable, super comfortable, and machine washable. There's a lot of other benefits. Check the link in the show notes. And in Black Friday, or around Black Friday, surrounding Black Friday, 50% off on a lot of clothing. And that works together with the promo code I'm about to give you. C-H-A-I, Chai. It stands for 18 in Hebrew. Use promo code Chai at twillery.com slash kosher money. You'll get $18 off your order of 139 plus. Free shipping, free returns, I think that's in the U.S. See if they ship elsewhere. There's so much on their website. Click around. See what works for you. You don't have to buy everything at once. Try some stuff out. See if you like it. Chances are you will enjoy. Now back to this week's episode. One question that we come back to as almost a recurring theme with some of our guests is when we look at biblical personalities, people throughout Torah, what common traits and I don't ask this as a shortcut, but what common traits do we see from those personalities who successfully attained wealth? Well, well <laughs> it's a little bit of a mixed record. I mean, L- love on as far as we know, was pretty wealthy. <laughs> he obtained his wealth in the way he obtained his wealth. But if we look at what we might call our role model, as opposed to the Rishayim in the Torah, Paro, you know, pl- plenty of bad guys were wealthy. But I think, you know, we we certainly see tremendous honesty and respect for the, particularly the property rights of others. How Avram Avinu, who did become very, very wealthy, as Hashem blessed him that he would be, would not allow, you know, his shepherds to graze on, on, on land that was being used by other shepherds. We find Yaakov's devotion to Lavan, as Yaakov himself describes over so many years, of being sure that there would be no hefsid, no loss to love on flock, how meticulous he was in that, in that honesty. So I think the one thing we see is that um, you, uh, you have to be meticulous in your cheshben. Chazal say that the Dor HaMabal was destroyed even though they did many, many Averas. But the one, the straw that broke the camel's back was Gezo, stealing, not respecting the boundaries of others. The very first question, I know you didn't ask about this, but that God will ask us after 120 years, is Nasasa Vinasata Bi Amuna. Did you conduct your business with Amuna? Now, Amuna, I want to point out, has a double translation. Amuna means with integrity, honesty. It also means faith in God. And the two Pshatim are very much linked. Because if you believe your parnasah comes from God, then how can you possibly think you're going to come out ahead in the long term at least by violating God's laws? So integrity in business comes from your emunah in Hashem. So I think the common denominator of our role models, Yosef, Yosef Atzadik, who became the phenomenally successful leader of Mitzrayim. Also, Chazal tell us, his honesty, his integrity, the reason he had Atzlacha was because he did not encroach 
on the boundaries of others. So I think, you know, honesty is, is something that's taken very, very seriously. Maybe it's an obvious, an obvious point. When Achav, who, although Achav may have done Shuvah towards the end of his life, but Achav was, most of his life was a Russia. When Achav kills Navos uh, because he wants his vineyard, so he has a trumped up charge. We see, of course, there was murder here, but, but, but it's not just murder. You, you see that there's a condemnation, not only on the murder, on the taking of property that was not his. And this is considered to be something that we don't necessarily take very seriously. We routinely commit all sorts of major or minor thefts, thinking they're minor, when in fact everything is, everything is major. So that's one of the things we have to be conscious of. I, I mean, I don't want to get into all the details because some of them are sorted, but sometimes people raise, a rechen will raise different shilas. Can I cheat here? Can I cheat here? Can I cut corners here? Jew versus non-Jew, government versus non-government. And people want to go over all sorts of subtle distinctions to justify various patterns of dishonesty. And Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky once made a very, very powerful, beautiful point. He said, morality cannot really be divided. If you're immoral towards some people and you think it's okay because they are who they are, inevitably it's going to poison you to the people that even you admit you have to be honest to. See, you can't kind of, you can't live this double life where I'm, I'm dishonest to some people and I'm honest to other people. You got to be ehrlich. You got to be sincere. You got to be honest. You got to have integrity vis-a-vis -vis everybody. Now, the MS is, Rav Yaakov's point, and this may have been where he got it from, is a ton of Dvelio. It's actually a medrash of Chazal that say, he who says, I can kill the idolater will eventually kill the Jew. He who says, I can steal from the idolater will steal from the Jew. Can't divide it. Can't divide it. And that's why it's, it's very unfortunate, excuse me for digressing on this, that when we think about a from Jew, a religious Jew, so we think about keep Shabbos, keeps kosher, puts on tefillin, hopefully learns Torah, but we don't think automatically, from Jew, honest in business, meticulous in caring about other people. We don't like, yeah, we know, if you, well, of course that's in the Torah, but we don't, we don't look at that as the definition of being a from Jew. And as a result, uh, we can have the sad phenomenon of Jews who are ostensibly from, who are not always living up to that standard. Now, Baruch Hashem, uh, we have to be careful against overgeneralization. Uh, we're talking about ultimately a small number, and it's important not to taint Achenu Pene Yisrael, who are Ehrlich and are honest. But still, the whole phenomenon is how can there be Orthodox Jews that sometimes fall short? It's kind of because we don't fold in that type of honesty into our definition of what it means to be a from Jew. And we need to point that out, that the Ben Adam L'Chabero is the same Torah that's Ben Adam L'Makam. In fact, there's a, a word from the Mabit, Mabit, uh, Rabbi Moshe Ben Yosef Trani, who was um, contemporary of the Beis Yosef in Sfat. And the Mabit points out that the Luchos, right? It's a very famous dichotomy that the first five of the Aseris Hadibros are mainly man to God, and the second five are man to man. So he points out that the second five have much fewer words than the first five. But he said the letters covered the same surface area. So that would mean, by definition, the engraving size of the Ben Adam Lechavera was larger than the Ben Adam Lachem. Ben Adam Lachem was smaller. So when Maishu Rabbeinu comes down from Har Sinai with the second Luchos, let's say the first Luchos were broken, second Luchos on Yom Kippur, and I'm putting on my glasses to see what's on those luchos. Which commandments am I going to see first? The Ben Adam Lamakam or the Ben Adam Lechavero? So says the Mabit, I'm going to see the Ben Adam Lechavero first because they're bigger. And that shows you the primacy by which we have to take these seriously.
So I'm not sure exactly where this starts. I, I, I think it has to start basically in elementary school chinuch, uh, in the yeshiva katanas, uh, all the way back, in which, you know, we don't just, you know, of course we have to talk about Shabbos, Kashrus, Emuna, and Hashem, which is the assault of everything. But we have to talk about honesty. In fact, Moshe Feinstein said, uh, why was it the Minag Yisrael in many places that the Haskalas Gemara, the first piece of Gemara that we teach kids, is Elu Metzias? And in fact, a lot of schools, they don't do that anymore because they Elu Metzias, that's not so, you know, Gela Maisa. We should teach brachos. We should, you know, things that are, you know, practical in everyday life. But Moshe Feinstein said, he said, he said, because a kid has to learn that respecting other people's property and taking care of other people's property is a yesod, should be yesodos. It is a foundation of a foundation of Judaism. We're not going to just start our chinuch with Kriya Shema and Shemona Esrei and Brachos. We're going to start with your chiv and the mamon of other people. So he said, and that was the myth. That was the genius, so to speak, of the Minag Yisrael to start with Elam Metzias. Because there's no... There's no particularly logical reason why that should be the beginning, but this is what Rabosha said, is the idea behind it. I'd love to see on the Tuesday where everyone's saying the tefillah of the shla, instead of that, maybe, you know, everyone posts their paid invoices and, you know, like stressing this idea, I think, is so critical. You know, it, it is important. You know, one can get into all sorts of reasons why... Uh, People do not stress this. I mean, in a way, the Yetzirah of money is a very, very powerful Yetzirah. You know, uh, there is a famous Chazal that, you know, why don't we have the urge for idolatry today? You know, you read in Tanakh, everybody's worshiping idols. You know, we don't bow down to idols. So the Gemara Yuma says that the Anshei Knesset Sagdola, the men of the Great Assembly at the beginning of the Second Temple, literally asked Hashem. They fasted for three days. And Hashem should take away the Yetzirah because it was so powerful. Right? So that's why we don't have that Yetzirah to bow down to an idol or whatever. But says the Vilna Gaon, there's never a vacuum. The Yetzirah of Avodah Zarah was replaced by the Yetzirah for money. Money, in other words, is the new Avodah Zarah. And uh, the Yetzirah is so strong, so powerful in various ways. Now, again, in extreme cases, it could involve mamish, mamish, you know, theft. But, but, but even, but it's not, the Baruch Hashem didn't go to that extreme. Cutting corners not being honest in our business, either misrepresenting things or not fully disclosing things, using office supplies, uh, you know, uh, using your paid time for, to play uh, solitaire or, or a battleship or whatever, whatever it is. All of these are, you know, you see in the Mishnah, an amazing thing. Chazal talked about uh, workers. I mean, this is, it's hard to even imagine this, that uh, workers who are, you know, paid by the hour when they took breaks, they were exempt from making a bracha before they ate, before they ate, because that would take up extra time from the employer. Huh? How long does it take to say a bracha? <laughs> it's, I mean, this is, a, this is a conception that is totally beyond anything we can even understand. Uh, you say a bracha slowly, it'll be 10 seconds. As I'll say, you cannot take 10 more seconds. All right, so today we don't pass in that way because today employers are mochel on this. Okay, but I think in some ways it's almost a hyperbole. Chazal wanted to take such an extreme halakha, it's a very extreme, to kind of reinforce, yeah, yeah, 10 seconds make a difference. That's how serious you got to take this. Because we're in Eretz Yisrael here at Arsamea, a beautiful campus, and thank you to our friend Zavi Kaufman, who, who helped arrange this, I, I do want to end off with Eretz Yisrael and, you know, I'm from America, you're also from America, but now you've lived here for 13 plus years. People who take the transition or are considering making that transition for Aliyah, there are a lot of financial concerns related to that. It's almost a, a different world out here where Sometimes American children, they even struggle if they're already established in a school in fifth, sixth grade, making that transition. It's hard for everyone at every age. Um, what message, either financially or um, practically, do you have for those that are considering making that move? 
You know, this indeed is a very, very difficult question. I think it's an agonizing question. On one hand, I do believe every Jewish person must think about Aliyah. The Ramban, of course, maintains that Yishav Eretz Yisrael is a mitzvah del raisa, it's a chi of del raisa. And even the Rambam, who does not count it as a technical chiyav, greatly extols the spiritual benefits and the holiness of living in Eretz Yisrael. So for a person to simply ignore this is just wrong. The Kuzari, no, a thousand years ago, the Melech, you know, Revuda Levi wrote both sides of the dialogue, but the Melech says, how come you Jews, you know, pray about Eretz Yisrael and you don't come? And the Chaver, the rabbi, answered, this is our shame, this is our busha. How can you not come to Eretz Yisrael? And keep in mind, a thousand years ago, coming to Eretz Yisrael was much, much, much more difficult than today. No direct flight. No direct flights, right, right. So for people to simply ignore this issue and not struggle with it, I think is an abdication of responsibility. Hashem has given us a great, great matana. How can we not take advantage of it? But at the same time, I cannot automatically say it is the right decision for everybody. A person has to be able to make a parnasa. A person has to be able to have some means of respectable income. Now, in some ways, in some areas, the cost of living is lower here in terms of tuition. That's a big, big relief for people. In other ways, it's more expensive. And of course, salaries are much, much lower. Now, I don't mean to say don't come to Israel unless you can make as much money as you make in America. If that would be the standard, and nobody would come to Eretz Israel. So, of course, for good and wonderful things, you give up a little bit, 100%. And, you know, you'll see there are things that I thought I needed. Maybe there were only once, and I can do without. But at some point, and every person is different, people have their breaking points. And once again, you're going to be a nervous wreck. You're going to be filled with anxiety. It's better, and as I said, it's better to be in, a, in an environment where you have menucha senefesh. And then we have to think about children. You know, the chinuch system here is a bit different. It's a little less user-friendly. It's a little less responsive to the individual needs of children. A parent has to make a cheshpan that I can't be at, just like Rabbi Zosalantra used to say, I can't be at tzaddik on somebody else's cheshpan. That's going to be a major, major issue. So... As a result, the decision of Aliyah needs what we call a das taira. You need to have a rav who knows you, who understands your family dynamic, who understands not just look at the phone book or something, but who knows your children, knows what they're going through, knows what would be matim for them, what would not be matim for them, and then make a decision. Then make a decision. I hope that people will come because there's great, great opportunity here. But... You can't come blindly. You need to, to make a cheshpan, both in terms of, again, the two areas are primarily uh, Parnassah and Chinuch. And then uh, the tremendous diversity of communities, for example. Even though in some sense Yerushalayim is the dream of every Jew, I will be honest with you, Yerushalayim may not be the best place for a family with younger children. There may be other places, say the Ramat Beit Shemesh or uh, Rehovot, you know, different places like that. So you shall lie him if you'll come and visit, but it may not be the place because of the chinuch structure and because of the unusual history of you shall lie him in terms of the zealousness and, and the like. Now, I will say this, that the Haredi world, for good or for bad, some people do not like this, other people applaud it, is going through some major, major transitions as a result of American Olim, in which there, and it's coming more from the bottom up and from the top down, in which they want their children to have more secular education. They want parnasa options, as opposed to simply saying, your only option is kolel for life, because that's not good for everybody, and uh, even psychologically, it has its toll on marriages and the like. So they're creating options. They're creating some schools with, which integrate some secular studies. They're creating, they don't want to push college for very good reasons, but they want to create parnasa institutes. Now, as they say, there are some people that think this is a totally trafe development coming from America. On the other hand, uh, we had Gedolim like Rav Steinman, uh, Zechreinah Levracha, who saw this as a tzorik, as a need. So 
I think in the over the next ten years, if Mashiach Has Shalom doesn't come, I think things will get better for Western Olim who need a you know Baltimore, Chicago that type of environment. I, th I think we're approaching that again. Some people think that's awful, but I'm just describing a fact. But I think Bimitzius, that is what's happening. But right now, it's still in a transitional stage. So uh, parents have to keep their eyes open. We'll be right back to our episode with Rabbi Breidowitz, but a word from our newest sponsor. This is the Next Door podcast. The word door sounds like next door, but door actually means generation in Hebrew. And the goal of this podcast is to help you be the best parent you can be. If you are not a parent, it helps you prepare to become a parent the best way you can be. They're bringing on experts, especially as what's going on in Israel. Parenting doesn't really come with a manual, right? There's no do A, B, and C, and you'll be well on your way. There are nuances, there are questions, and they're trying to provide answers. They have conversations with uh, mental health therapists, with trauma experts, with parenting experts, people that have been asked questions that people all over the world have at a time like this, and they are having very open, transparent, and impactful conversations in ways that help you. Highly recommend checking it out. Click on the link in the show notes, subscribe, listen, see which topic talks to you, right? There are topics that are applicable to different families depending on where you live. Um, if you're in Israel, check it out. If you're in America, check it out. It's an English-speaking podcast. They have a website with resources, what's coming soon. Um, they have a whole month dedicated to child safety. Really, really, really cool stuff and much needed. So shout out to everyone at Jen Aleph, the Next Door podcast. Give a listen, like and subscribe, do all the good stuff. And now back to this week's episode. There's so much to cover as it relates to money and the Jew or money and the person, what closing remarks, what did we not cover as it relates to money? We're recording this in 2023, but my expectation and hope is people are going to be listening to this in the years 2033, 2043, and beyond. What constant lesson what what constant message stays true regardless of the environment whether it's a recession whether we're seeing inflation whether there's turmoil war times of peace what what didn't we cover as it relates to money that would be interesting yeah well i'm, I'm not sure if if we didn't cover it at all i think we touched on a lot of things but i think you know the simple idea here is that Money is a means and not an end. And, and you have to ask yourself, why am I doing this? Why am I working? Why am I earning money? What is the purpose of money? Now, clearly the old saying, money is the root of all evil. No, may be true. It may be the root of all evil, but it's not only evil. Money, I'm not going to say it's the root of all good, but money is certainly a generator of a tremendous amount of good. And a person has to ask himself, every person, what is my life about? Like, why am I here? What is it that I want to accomplish for the life? What is it that Hashem wants me to accomplish with my life? To create a family, hopefully. To have a, a loving marriage. To be a caring and concerned parent. To care about my community. To use my resources to make the world or my little part of the world a better place. And then... The earning of money becomes avodah Hashem. It becomes a way of glorifying Hashem, besides the Kiddush Hashem in terms of your honesty at work and the like. So I think we get confused. And it's, it's an obvious mistake. It's not, not, this is not any Kiddush, but it, we get confused between means and ends. And we take something that should be a very, very important means and we turn it into an end. For example, the prevailing career ethic in America is you got to keep on progressing, progressing, progressing to make as much money as you possibly can. Well, is that necessarily so? Why is that so? If I have enough money to take, take care of my family and give stuck up, what is the push? I have to make more. 
I mean, people have like 30 cars. I, I, I hear, you know, uh, like, why, you know, why? You know, what's wrong with 28 cars, you know? And a person in America sometimes feels like a failure if they're not making as much money as they can. Maybe their parents will look at them as a failure. They'll say, you're not ambitious enough. Well, why do I have to be ambitious? You know, or maybe my ambition could be turned to Torah or Chesed or family time. So people work, 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 work. You know what they say? There's a, there's a saying, again, it's a secular saying. At the end of a person's life, he's not going to say, I wish I made another deal. Gee, why didn't I go into the office last Sunday? A person's going to say, you know, why didn't I spend more time with my wife? Why wasn't I kinder to my children? Why didn't I care more about people? These are the feelings, the thoughts that come to people at the end of their lives. And if Ruch Hashem, Hashem has given us life, then why don't we try to live a life where we're not going to be filled with all of those regrets at the very end? So money can be a very, very valuable force for good. But you've got to look at it as a means and not as an end in and of itself. Yes, that's the basic point, I think. For Brido, it's thank you so much for... Thank you so much. Much, much bracha and Thank mm -hmm. you for your good work. Thank you. Beautiful. What a spectacular episode. We're here with Reb Zevi Kaufman, who made it all happen. He is the extraordinaire behind the scenes of the Arsameh Podcast Network, the uh, head of Cedar Media Studios, which pulled this all together. Zevi, the people listening to this outro, like you said, are the diehards, right? Rabbi Breidowitz. I have a, a friend, Mendy, who calls Rabbi Breidowitz his Rosh Hashiva. He's never met him before. Rabbi Breidowitz just left this center base medrash. We're going to get some beautiful B-roll of this majestic campus. But Rabbi Breidowitz, who's the host of my favorite podcast, the Q&A with Rabbi Breidowitz, which you produce, and it's phenomenal. We'll put a link into the show notes, all the links that are, are relevant if someone wants to reach out. What does Rabbi Breidowitz's day look like now? So he goes out and is he walking down Rehov Shimon HaTzadik? What, what, what is his day? Is, is he speaking all day? Email? What's going on? So I can't, I can't say that I fully know where Rabbi Breidowitz's day is, but what I do know is from the realm of his, his output, Shiram Weiss. So there's a combination. There's, first of all, the many uh, shirim that he gives in Yeshiva Sar Sameach, which is his home as Rav of Kilas Sar Sameach. And he gives for, I think, practically every program here. He gives his Q&A, which is the basis for, for his podcast, uh, where he you know where he treats uh, questions ranging from people of all backgrounds. So that's a major one. He gives shirim on, on Tomer Devorah within the Yeshiva. He gives shirim on, on different Jewish holidays. But... Way broader, <laughs> way broader. He gives shirim for the OU Center. He gives shirim in Maya Note. He gives shirim across the board. And not only that, but um, we're, we're constantly getting questions that are addressed to Rabbi Breidowitz. I think he even mentioned earlier that he spends, I, I can't, I, I don't know how much time, I don't know how he even figures it out because sometimes we'll, we'll, we'll discuss, you know, different questions um, that come in because we'll want to, them to be featured on the, on the podcast. But he's answering questions, whether it be via email, whether it be in the Shirim Q&A format. He's spending hours and hours and hours a day just trying to help out Klai Yisrael in different ways. And um, his Shirim output, I, I, I can't guess, but I don't know. We have to be talking about, I don't know, 20, 30, maybe more Shirim a week. I don't even know. He's, it's, it's unbelievable. I'm fascinated by his broad range. You can talk to him once about the state of media in Israel, and then he'll talk to you about organ transplants and goats. You know, like really, really, really phenomenal where it's almost like he opens up a directory. He's like, oh, you want to talk about that? No problem. Here are my... And each time you, you're almost getting like a different angle. What's interesting is that even the same question, he'll treat the same question through a different angle in different contexts to different people, but all from a truth and also... What I found is that he'll treat, he'll, he'll really show the multidimensional aspects, which really appeals to such a broad, a broad audience. Things are not as binary as people think that they are. Things are way more complex and always coming with a fresh yet authoritative Masora grounded view on, on 
you know, things like AI, right? We've discussed that. Right. Like how, how does Judaism, I remember when, when ChatGPT came out, I brought it to Robert Breitowitz and we're discussing, you know, we're discussing, well, you know, the positive aspects, the, the negative aspects, where this could go. We tried to figure out if it, you know, could tell the difference between the different Kir Vishivas. Okay, it took it a while to figure that one out. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's, it's really, you know, and the feedback that we've gotten is, is tremendous. I'm fascinated because as we were talking, sometimes you'll have a producer and he's off doing his own thing and you were like, just looking, listening, you're stimulated. It, it's, he, he really brings it each and every day. And that's why I love it. This is not a, a paid ad by any means, but the Q and A, I post it to my WhatsApp status all the time. Um, I only recently discovered him um, through a friend, but the Q and A with Rabbi Breidowitz, he's basically sitting in a room fielding questions that he's many times he doesn't know. He does know. Questions are not submitted in advance. Oh, they're not. And um, it's really the core of the Q and A is really is really um, within our Samach. It was our Samach that believed in it, and you know they've you know enabled that we're able to share it with the with the larger world. You know, being that our Samach is uh, is a yeshiva for you know it's a it's a yeshiva for beginners. So really geared the content for people of all different backgrounds. But we have we have mere yeshiva guys who come in. Right. I can't tell you how many how many guys are on their way to Rabbi Ram Yeshua in Brisk wow. who are listening to Rabbi Bradowitz and they tell me on their way they're like oh Zabi I just heard your voice you know and Rabbi Bradowitz is Q&A uh -huh. and then and then you have and then you have guys who are in the middle of their garrus you know in Oklahoma uh -huh. who are reaching out you know uh, about about how powerful you know the ideas that they're getting so the Q&A is Rabbi Bradowitz he he opens up we're actually we're hoping that Bezer Hashem will, will we may start doing some live ones we've done some on Zoom as well maybe to really open it up to the broader the broader community where you know, people are really getting getting a tremendous amount of of chizuk from it. They they get a lot. We got to bring Eric Breitowitz back to America for an event <laughs> with Yaakov. We got a living lachaim event. That would be really special. Um, but but this is phenomenal. Um, I didn't want it to stop, but I wanted to be respectful of his time. This is one of those times. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you're recording an episode. It's good, forty five minutes, an hour, and you're like, okay. But I was like, could we actually do a two hour episode? But We'll do it in pieces. I, I do want to come just back. Ran back. He probably just ran back to either to answer emails or to give another sheer. Oh, wow. You know, like it, it's it's constantly somebody who's, who's always, you know, is always always looking to give, always looking to uh, be able to, you know, to be machazic people. Phenomenal. When I'm driving and I, I don't really listen to podcasts. I don't like podcasts. <laughs> but when, if I'm in bed and I, and I just want to listen or I'm driving there's there's something very relaxing to the way he, you know, it's not a one word answer. He, there's nuances, there's thoughts, his ability to, to pull out of history, names, dates, um, stories. I love that he weaves stories in. There's there's a real talent. There's the halacha. There's the hashkaf. Right, right. There's the weaving back and forth. And we saw that he's also he was also familiar with kosher money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, even there were certain things like you mentioned. You mentioned uh, you know about poverty. There were certain episodes that he referenced even, right. which were fascinating. Right. I'm always blown away by by who listens and uh, super appreciative. And we got to do this again. That's what it's It's great having you out here in your shalai. Thank you. And we got to get Yaakov. Yeah. Yaakov, we're talking to you. Yaakov. Jerusalem. Come by. He, he would, yeah, we can pack the house. Um, we could do it here. We... Right away, was talking about it. Yeah. You know, it's, it's uh, again, you have to do that analysis. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm, my, my hope is that this episode gets hundreds of thousands of views and God willing, my, my goal is at the very least, tens of thousands of people discover, even though I'm sure mm. millions, world, millions will watch this episode, yeah. but we'll, but if we can, hook people into his ecosystem even a dozen people it's an opener it's an yeah. opener he actually once said in an interview or ever brought it i believe uh, i'm not going to quote it verbatim but he spoke about how his the question and answers it's not meant that this is like the final say it's meant to be an opener it's meant to be it's meant to be an opener where you have what we would say in hebrew the roshi prokim where you have an opener to this sigya to this to this thing and then you can go and you become empowered now that I know what the tzaddim are, now that I know the two sides of the issue, now I can go. I could speak to my own local Orthodox rabbi and be able to figure out where do I fit? How, where, how can I discover more? Sure. Thank you to our friends at the OU Living Smarter Jewish. If you need a financial resource, team up with them. Thank you to our sponsors, Approved Funding, Kol Al Chabad, and Twillery. Zevi said I was on the wrong side. 
the T is on the left, and I was facing this way. I, I didn't get one yet, but I know that Ellie's working on it. Yes, we're going to hook uh, Zevi up with these uh, wonderful uh, clothing, the shirts, the, the pants, the suits. Thank you to Yeshua behind the camera. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, if you want bonus content, uh, we're in the Mishpacha magazine as well. So mishpacha.com. Um, there's, a, there's a lot going on. We're just getting warmed up. They have podcasts too. They do have podcasts. Yes. Check out their podcast. Uh, I think podcasts are the future. It's definitely, definitely the future. You have other podcasts on the... We have, so yeah, we have, we have Arsameh also has uh, Rabbi David Kaplan. We have Rabbi Sinclair. We have uh, Mr. Harry Rothenberg. We have, um, let's see one second. Let's keep them counting. We have, we have a bunch of that are still in production. We have Rabbi Gottlieb, Rabbi David Gottlieb, Rabbi Dr. David Gottlieb. And they all have their own unique approach within the Arsameh network ecosystem. You have a link that we could put that. Should... Yeah, sure, sure, okay. sure. So we have ohr.edu and we will also give whatever other links. There are other ones that are in, in production as well, but feedback's been incredible. There's never been the podcast medium. I, we, could, we, we could discuss that for hours yeah. about how it's life-changing to be able to have long-form content that has substance right. that people can they can listen to at their leisure at the speed that they can. And it's such, it's such an empowering medium. It's hard. I, you know, I'm also a musician and composer. Sure. It's hard for me to listen to music because there's so much, there's so many worlds today that you can get in the, in the world of podcasts. Mm -hmm. Of course, music has its place as well, but, but there's, there's nothing comparable. Look at, look at how many people kosher money has, has helped in terms of their, their views on finances how they're able to, you know, to integrate budgeting into their families. It's a world that we're creating. It's right. incredible. Right. And we're just getting warmed up. So, Reb Zevi, thank you so much. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Looking forward. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for listening to another episode of Kosher Money. We're in the 60s. I can't believe that. Literally, if someone discovered Kosher Money for the first time and said, I want to listen to an episode of Kosher Money for the next year plus... They'd be, they'd be able to listen to an episode of Kosher Money one per week. So if this is your first ever episode that you're listening to, we have episodes that have amassed millions of views. Um, we have shorts. We're sending those out on Instagram, YouTube, different, different places that you can capture. Not everyone has the ability or the mental capacity to listen to an hour-long conversation. But if you did and you didn't just skip to this outro, power to you. If you are still listening, I want you to add a word to the bottom of this video in the comment section. If you're listening on YouTube, write the word genius, right? I think that really sums up Robert Breidowitz. He is actually genuine and genius. Pick whichever word you want. I was so surprised at his ability to answer questions as if he was asked it and had three weeks to prepare. So that just shows you the breadth of knowledge that he has, and I'm always fascinated by it. I can't wait to do a, do another conversation with him. I, I think this we recorded this the week before the attacks in Israel, and our conversation about moving to Israel, um, there was a lot there. And yeah, I'm all over the place right now, but it was a great conversation it was uh one one on my bucket list and i'm not crossing it off yet because i want to do more with him he has really really awesome content as you heard with zevi and subscribe listen i listen to it all the time i'm not a big podcast guy to be honest but he is one of the few that i do listen to so i don't drive i used to drive a lot more but because i don't drive um i think that that's a key component but enough about me okay thank you for everything like and subscribe add that comment use the word genius or genuine use it in a sentence somehow and thank you so much for everything we'll see you next time bye living l'chaim